Today we're going to give you an overview of living liver donation. We're very excited that you're interested in this prospect to help uh, people who need liver transplantation. We are going to give you a very comprehensive overview about uh, living liver donation. And the three of us who are going to be giving you this presentation today are myself. I'm Kim Oltoff. I'm the Chief of Transplant Surgery. And the other two are going to introduce themselves right now as well. My name is Tess Bitterman. I'm Medical Director of the Living Liver Donor Program here at Penn. And I am Linda Wood, and I am the Living Donor Nurse Coordinator for the program. So we're going to go over all these things that are listed on this slide here, and we're going to um, start with basic things that you should know. Dr. Bitterman. Thank you. Um, so living liver donor transplantation is a life-saving measure for people with end-stage liver disease. We also believe that it's a better alternative for most transplant candidates. Organ allocation regulations are ever-changing, and waiting time for a deceased donor organ can be challenging currently, and we expect will be continue to be challenging in the future. And so therefore, patients are asked to advocate for themselves to find a living donor. I want to go over some of the issues pertaining to confidentiality and disclaimers. It's important to realize that a donor may opt out at any time and for any reason, up until general anesthesia is administered. Your health information as a donor is secure and is separate from the recipient's record. Recipient health information and risks are also confidential and are protected under privacy laws. Therefore, all communication is strictly confidential. Recipients might be informed that there is a donor in evaluation, if a donor has been approved, or if there are no potential living donors to consider at this time. You can share as much or as little as you want regarding your health information or motivations with your recipient, but we cannot. There are other important aspects to consider. Every donor undergoes a psychosocial assessment of risk criteria for certain illnesses, such as HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, and that's in accordance with U.S. policy. Donors are also screened for infectious diseases, such as the ones I've already mentioned. It is a federal crime to sell or purchase human organs, and you cannot receive anything of valuable consideration in exchange for donation. Although rare, donation could have an impact on obtaining health, life, or disability insurance in the future. And if you feel any pressure in donating, make our team aware immediately. There are alternatives for both donors and recipients. For donors, you always have the option to change your mind. This is a completely voluntary act on your part. On the recipient side, their physicians may choose to uh, pursue medical management. The recipient may undergo a deceased donor transplant. Recipients might be listed at multiple centers to improve their odds of getting transplanted. And potentially, they could explore alternate living donor options. I'm now going to pass it on to Linda Wood to discuss some aspects of the living donor team. Thanks very much. The living donor team follows a multidisciplinary approach to care. All discussions and decisions are made with you, the donor, as our central focus in this process. An independent living donor advocate will also be available to assist you in this journey. The independent living donor advocate role is required for all living donor programs in all transplant centers in the United States. The donor advocate works independently but collaboratively with the living donor team. The sole focus of the living donor advocate is to look after the interests of the donor and support the donor through the entire process. 
The independent living donor advocate will also assist the donor in obtaining, educating, and understanding relevant information, such as consent process, the evaluation process, the surgical procedure, the medical, psychosocial, and financial risks, and the importance of and commitment to post-donation follow-up. Most of all, the independent living donor advocate works to ensure the donor's decisions are respected and ensures the decision is um, informed, free from pressure by the recipient or any family or friends, and is without financial compensation or manipulation. Living Donor Nurse Coordinator is your clinical resource. The coordinator screens the inquiries and escalates and communicates information to the team. The coordinator facilitates the evaluation process and educates the donor and their families in all phases of care. The coordinator will also prepare the donor for surgery and will ensure that the case is coordinated with the recipient team. Other members of the living donor team are the living donor surgeon and the medical liver specialist, a hepatologist. They work together to review your reasons for wanting to be a donor. They review your medical, surgical, social, family history, and set expectations for the evaluation, the surgery, and the postoperative period, and discuss the risks of the living donor surgery from their perspective. They'll also determine if additional individualized testing or other consults are needed. The cardiologist ensures that your heart is healthy enough for this type of surgery. The social worker will review your financial information and social support and can provide information regarding certain assistance programs that are available to you as a living donor. The psychiatrist will assess your mental health history and your coping mechanisms. The nutritionist will assess whether your weight is healthy enough for this type of surgery and whether you need to make any changes such as lose weight. The pharmacist will review your medications and any that may need to be temporarily stopped in preparation for this surgery. And lastly, the financial coordinator will work to prevent any charges from being that are associated with living donation from getting billed to the donor. I'm going to spend a couple minutes just discussing uh, some important parts about the liver. So the liver is responsible for the metabolic needs of the body. Uh, it also makes the proteins that help blood to clot. The liver is located in the upper abdomen above the belly button on the right side and is protected by the rib cage. The liver is a large segmented organ that can be split without harm to the donor. And during surgery, it is possible that the surgeons will remove the gallbladder. After surgery, the donor and recipient livers will grow in size to meet the body's needs. So let's discuss the living donor process. At this point, you are already well into the referral process. You completed the online screening form at pentransplant.donorscreen.org. This screening is done in partnership with the National Kidney Registry, the NKR. You've had your screening labs drawn and based on review of those results, have been moved forward and completed a telephone screening with the independent living donor advocate. Our screening criteria focuses on the following points. The donor must be in very good health. The donor should be between the ages of 21 and 50 years of age, but slightly older or slightly younger donors may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The donor should be blood type compatible with the recipient and should not be overweight. The donor must have health insurance and should have a primary care physician. You may request a copy of our donor and or recipient selection criteria by contacting us. 
Once you've completed viewing this video, please complete the forms that were sent to you. And if you wish to proceed with the evaluation process after viewing the video, please contact our office to speak to your donor coordinator. That information is contained in the instructions that you have received. The next step in the process is the donor evaluation. This process can take three to five weeks to complete, and you'll be asked to come to our center two to three separate times. You will have a medical evaluation, a surgical evaluation, a psychosocial evaluation with social work, psychiatry, and the independent living donor advocate. You will also have diagnostic tests and lab tests. We will ask you to provide us with age-appropriate screening tests done as part of your own health maintenance, such as mammogram, pap smear, or colonoscopy, depending on your age. You may also need to meet other living donor team members and specialists if indicated, such as infectious disease, hematology, or pulmonology. Once all the testing and consults have been completed and resulted, the team will meet to discuss your case. At each point in the evaluation process, your results will be made available to you and explained to you if you need. The team will determine one decision that comes from any of the following. If you are declined, that means that the team feels that living donation is not safe for you. The most common reasons are the size or anatomy of your liver, or perhaps some psychosocial concerns. It is also possible that you could be declined for reasons concerning the recipient, for example, a change in their health status or a potential poor outcome is expected. The team may also feel that additional testing is needed. In this case, the team feels that additional testing or consults are needed for the team to be able to come to a final decision. If this is the case, your donor coordinator will notify you and explain what is needed and field any questions you may have. If you're approved for donation, in this case, the team feels that all the testing results and all the consults are complete with no additional items needed. Uh, the team has discussed and has approved you for living liver donor surgery. If you are approved, you will be given time to reflect on your decision before we notify the recipient team. Once you have made your decision, the recipient will be notified and a date of surgery will be identified. This date will be suitable for the donor, the recipient, and the transplant team. The surgery is timed so all the members of the surgical team are present. You should be aware that special circumstances exist for distance donors and international donors that require them to stay local to our center or within a commutable distance for a period of time after the surgery. If you are a distance or international donor, this will be discussed with you at length during your evaluation process to allow you time to prepare. So if you've gotten this far in the evaluation, you've then come to the point where you have a preoperative visit. And this preoperative visit is with the surgeon um, and, and the surgical associates. We schedule this preoperative visit one to two weeks prior to the surgery so that we can go over all the little details and logistics that are involved with the surgery itself. There's no real special diet we want you to stay on to prepare you for the surgery, but we do encourage you to continue to make healthy food choices and to continue to maintain or, or even to continue to lose weight if you had been asked to do that previously. We ask you to prepare for about four to five hours for the preoperative visit because you'll be seeing a number of different people and doing a number of different testing. You will be doing autologous blood donation, or uh, donating a unit of your blood to have just in case it's needed during the surgery. Uh, we will be getting preoperative laboratory blood drawn. We will also be signing surgical consents and reviewing the pre-procedure information as well as going over a detailed sort of day-to-day, hour-by-hour, uh, what your hospital stay will be like. 
And then we might add some additional appointments uh, depending on your individual needs um, that uh, might be required and be helpful prior to the surgery itself. On the day of surgery, uh, you will be arriving at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania or HUP very early on the morning of surgery, usually around six or seven in the morning. You and the recipient will be in separate operating rooms side by side, and the donor, you, will be going to the operating room one to two hours before the recipient. Um, general anesthesia is what's needed for living donation, and most often we also have patients receive an epidural, which is done prior to going to sleep. Then there are numerous monitoring and, and other devices that will be placed once after you're asleep, such as uh, IV line that's in your neck, which is called a central line, an arterial line in your wrist, which monitors your blood pressure, Foley catheter that drains the urine in your bladder. Uh, there's a tube in your nose that drains the, the, the fluid from your stomach and other external monitoring uh, sensors and such. The surgical procedure itself takes about six hours once uh, the incision is made. It can be shorter or it can be longer, uh, and there's also time before that and after that for anesthesia. So anybody waiting for you should know that this is a full day of waiting uh, in the waiting area. If at any point during the operation we feel that it's not safe to proceed for your safety, for the donor safety, the surgery will be stopped. Also during the surgery, uh, we will have someone come down to the waiting area, usually our living donor coordinator that will keep any family members or, or friends updated on what is happening in the operating room and how things are proceeding. An important thing to remember is that up until you undergo general anesthesia, you are, uh, you are able to change your mind and say, this is not something I want to do. The surgery itself, as we said, is performed in two adjacent operating rooms. We bring the donor to the operating room usually before the recipient surgery starts. Once we're sure that everything is going okay with the donor, we then bring the recipient to the operating room as well. There are two potential incisions that we might have. One is if we're taking out a, a large piece of liver for another adult for a right or left lobe, whole, whole lobe donation. And that's on the picture on the left side, which looks like a hockey stick. And if you want to see what uh, an actual incision looks like, you can see this uh, woman on the left was our donor. That's her incision, and she donated to the recipient on the right. If you are donating a right or left lobe, you will have your gallbladder removed uh, and an, an x-ray of your bile duct done so we can have a roadmap of what the uh, bile ducts look like. If you are giving a left lateral segment or a small piece of your liver for a child, then a smaller incision is needed, and that's the upper midline incision as you see pictured on the right side. And this looks uh, uh, like this mom here who donated to her son. We do a very careful dissection of the vessels and use of very special instruments are used to uh, divide the liver itself into two different pieces while keeping both sides uh, very safe and connected by all the vessels. Depending on the circumstances, we'll be removing either approximately 25% of your liver if you're donating a small piece to a, a child or up to 65% of your liver uh, if you're donating uh, to an adult. Once we're finished, you will wake up in the operating room and the breathing tube will be removed. You will have one or two drains in place and then all those other tubes that we just talked about on the previous slide. After your surgery, you will be taken to the post-anesthesia recovery unit or the PACU for observation. Have you go there so we can make sure that your epidural and uh, pain management is adequate and that you're breathing fine and there, there's no evidence of any very early post-operative issues. You are then transferred to the surgical ICU for very close observation uh, and monitoring and care for the first 24 hours or so 
And then on that first post-operative day, you'll be transferred to our transplant unit. Hospital day itself is about five to seven days. As far as the expectations of what could can happen and what we uh, see for our donors and what you can expect as a donor, we like to have the donors out of bed on the first post-operative day with and ambulating and walking every day after that. Clear liquids are usually started on the first day after we remove that tube from your nose, just with sips first and then a few more clear liquids the following day. And we usually start a regular diet by about day three. The pain is controlled with the epidural catheter as well as IV medications. With, and then we transition to oral pain medications um, about day three. We do try to minimize the use of narcotics and most pain is, can be controlled with things such as uh, Tylenol uh, or acetaminophen and um, non-steroidals such as Motrin. And then the drain that we put in place is uh, most often removed prior to your discharge. Now, as far as what our post-operative goals are, we want you out of bed early. We want you to walk early. We ask you to do deep breathing because we want you to expand your lungs. Uh, we are very uh, uh, aware of the need for pain management and we everybody is different and we talk about the different ways that we can control pain and we advance diet as tolerated. We're not going to let you go home until you're able to eat and drink without difficulty. We want to make sure your discomfort is managed appropriately and that you're able to manage self-care, which is basically just taking care of yourself as far as going to the bathroom, walking around going upstairs walking without assistance. You will be discharged uh, with pain medications and oral narcotic pain medication but as I said we do try to minimize this and to use narcotics as, as little as possible. Now we'll go on to the post discharge, discharge care. I'm going to ask Linda to go over all these details. So the most important precaution after a surgery like this is lifting. Do not lift anything heavier than 10 pounds for a full three months after donation. A good way to gauge this 10 pound limit is to consider the weight of a gallon of milk. We ask you not to drive until you are off narcotic pain medication and have been cleared by the surgical team. Walking, in all honesty, is the best exercise. Strenuous activity and exercise should be avoided until the surgical team advances you. It's perfectly okay to walk up and down stairs, to shower, to go out, always being guided by how you feel. We ask that you not immerse yourself in water. So we, so we say to avoid taking a tub bath or going swimming or going in a hot tub until the incision and the drain site are completely healed. Most donors return to work in about six to eight weeks after the surgery, but in rare instances, you may need as long as three months to recover. If your job requires strenuous activity or heavy listing, you can expect to need a full three months before being released to return to work. Although rare, it's possible that you may find that you do not return to your pre-donation lifestyle or may experience some body image changes, guilt, anxiety, or depression. If you feel that you are becoming depressed or chronically anxious, please talk to your healthcare provider. Get help. Many people also find that support groups make a big difference. As discussed earlier, post-surgical follow-up is extremely important. We are required to see you at very specific time points and report our findings to our regulatory bodies. You can expect to have your first post-discharge follow-up with the surgeon within 10 to 14 days of discharge. From there, you will see the surgeon every two weeks for two additional visits. If everything is proceeding as expected, you'll uh, come back to our center at the three-month mark for an MRI of your abdomen to see the hepatologist and to have additional labs drawn. 
at the six months time, you will also come back. And this may be a telemedicine appointment or may need to be in person. And you'll see the hepatology and have labs drawn. You'll have labs drawn at every visit. The one year and two year anniversary appointments can be conducted with the donor coordinator and the labs can be drawn local to your home. Whenever there's a major surgery, we need to talk about potential risks of that surgery itself. And this is major surgery. It is something that we'll go over in great detail if you, if you end up becoming scheduled for a uh, donation surgery. Uh, but we will run through a few of the things that are possible to happen here. One thing that you need to recognize is that while all these potential risks and complications are possible, they are very rare events. Uh, and we are proud uh, of our program here that our uh, complication rate and risk is very, very low for our donors. So there's the minor types of risks, which are uh, types of things that occur that require a small amount of intervention or no treatment at all. And these are such things as acid reflux or change in your bowel habit, habits. You might have some swelling of your ankles. You might have a urinary tract infection because a Foley is put in place and there's a possibility of wound infection as well. Because of the way your arms and uh, are positioned during surgery, there is a potential to get some numbness and tingling in your fingers, such as when you're you're, uh, you fall asleep on your hands at nighttime and you wake up and they feel funny. And this does go away with time as well. Moderate uh, risks are ones that will need some sort of treatment to, to uh, repair or uh, fix. One is a bile leak. There's lots of small bile ducts that are on the, on the surface, cut surface of the liver when we split a liver in half. Um, most of the time, these are always uh, ligated and not leak. There is a small chance that one of these little uh, ducts may leak. We should be able to see that it's a leak from what we see in the drain that's left in place. Uh, if that's the case, these uh, leaks usually heal on their own just by leaving the drain in a little bit longer. Sometimes there is a intervention with uh, endoscopy that's required in order to uh, have the leak go away. Because you're in the hospital and because you have surgery, there's always the possibility of a blood clot in your legs or uh, um, pulmonary issues. Uh, these we try to prevent. We give sub-Q heparin and other interventions and make you walk early to prevent any blood clots in your legs. Um, pneumothorax is something that could happen just because the anesthesiologist puts in a central line. And this is repaired as well with, with a, a small tube that uh, has your lung uh, re-expand. Hernias are possible just anytime there's surgery. But, but as I said, all of these are very rare and uh, occur very infrequently. Now, anytime there's major surgery, there's always the possibility of acute liver failure or death. These have happened in donors across the country, not here at the University of Pennsylvania, but it's always possible with any major surgery. I, on the right side are some of the complications that we have seen at Penn, uh, but as I stated before, they're very rare. They have been uh, transient and have gone away and have been able to be treated. Um, so there are some conditions that are reportable after donation. We are required to draw and store blood samples from donors for up to 10 years. And that is for the purpose for screening for infectious diseases and investigating potentially um, donor-derived diseases to the recipient. There are also some conditions that develop after donation that we need to report to the transplant center as they could affect the health of the recipient. Examples of these conditions are any infectious disease or malignancy, such as i.e. cancer, um, that is discovered during the first two years of postoperative care. If you report one of these conditions, the following actions may be required. The recipient might be notified. We may need to report to local, state, or federal public health authorities as required by law. We may need to um, notify the recipient transplant center if for some reason it's not Penn. 
And we may also need to notify the OPTN Improving Safety Portal, which is a national donor database. Importantly, if your doctor suspects that a health issue is related to your donation, please notify your living donor coordinator as soon as possible so we can coordinate the clinical evaluation here at Penn. Let's talk about some other important information, such as financial information and billing. The recipient's insurance usually covers your medical expenses, but some insurance carriers may have special requirements to cover living donors. Given this, there may be expenses to you. Typically, the recipient's insurance does not cover expenses such as lost wages or travel expenses. For those who qualify, there is a government assistance grant to help cover expenses for donors. This is based on income, and our social worker can answer questions regarding this option. Outcome data that includes national and center-specific data is available for you to review at www.srtr.org. We encourage you to review this data. As always, our team is available to answer any questions you may have regarding the donor or recipient outcomes at our center. The, um, the transplant uh, and donor team has a surgeon, a physician, a transplant coordinator, nurse practitioner on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And they are available to receive organ offers, to recover deceased donor organs, to perform transplant surgeries, and to address urgent clinical needs of our uh, inpatients and our outpatients. If there is a change in our ability to provide this coverage, we will notify you. If there is a local or regional emergency that impacts our ability to provide transplant care, we uh, will use the available resources to notify you and identify a local or regional center that will help transfer your care. United Network for Organ Sharing is a U.S. federal agency that oversees organ donation and transplant for all organs in the United States. This organization keeps the national patient waiting list for organ transplants. For questions about donation and transplant-related concerns or to file a grievance, please contact the numbers on the slide. The outcome data that you were sent is collected and reported to the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. If you would like more information, you may go to the website also noted on the slide. Lastly, UNOS and CMS requires that the transplant be provided in a Medicare-approved transplant center to ensure the recipient's ability to have immunosuppression medication paid for by Medicare. The Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania is currently an approved Medicare transplant center. The Penn Transplant Institute will notify you if our CMS or Medicare status changes. Thank you for listening to this presentation. We hope this was informative. If you are willing to move forward with the living donor process, please contact our team at 215-349-8220. This information is also in the instructions you have received. We look forward to meeting you.